a sensation of bitterness, a sensation of a minty smell. I have to say minty at Christmas rather than rosy. So, um, so we have um, particular sensations, uh, which are the um, ingredients for our perceptions of particular things, you see. Um, both of which are distinct from concepts in the more general or abstract sense. So, yes, um, um, we have, according to Leibniz, concepts which are innate, innate in the sense that they bubble up out of our mental activity, um, perceptions, but they too emerge out of our mental activity. We have sensations, feelings, but they too emerge out of the inner mental activity. And amazingly, they correlate with what's going on elsewhere. That's the parallel. You see. Where um, uh, Descartes uh, would say that you have a particular sensation because of some stimulus to the sense organs which is transmitted through the, the brain and the animal fluids to uh, produce um, a change of conscious state. He has a cause-effect theory of sense perception. Yes, um, but uh, not so Leibniz. There are no cause-effect processes producing sensations or perceptions. That is to say, in terms of external causes. the synchronization of the idea with what's going on, that synchronization is God's doing in this perfectly harmonized system. Okay. Um, one other phrase that he uses, the whole system operates as a pre-established harmony. A pre-established harmony. Yeah. Okay. Now that's what leads him, and we'll see this next time as we get into the problem of evil. That's what leads him to say this is the best of all possible worlds. The best of all possible worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what individuates, distinguishes individuals. Okay, um, does this uh, pull together what you're getting from the reading? Uh, I, I reread all the Leibniz stuff this morning, and it. Um, it seems to me that the, both the monadology and even more the uh, principles of nature and grace uh, are really very, very clear. Um, you, you have to read them carefully, but um, they're, they're pretty explicit and pretty clear in these regards. Now, um, whatever else we, uh, we do in connection with Leibniz, we've got to have this monadology straight. Now, isn't that the case with all of these figures? That if you want to know why they think as they do about epistemology, about ethics, about God, about the problem of evil, you have to get to the underlying metaphysical scheme. You see. The metaphysical assumptions are just foundational to the whole thing. Um, in fact, you can... Um, pretty well take that as a rule of thumb for whatever subject you're discussing, you see. Not just philosophical topics, uh, but um, if you're discussing 
what, um, uh, Buchanan's candidacy for the presidency? Um, yes, and why his um, particular kinds of America first values? All right, start asking yourself about what are the underlying metaphysical assumptions in that sort of a thing. Well, how do you get at that? Well, certain kinds of values have certain assumptions about the nature of the reality that he regards as a value. But always go back to those assumptions. Well, we, um, we've seen that all the way through from, um, I suppose, Plato onwards that all of the various pieces of Plato's philosophy come together once you get that divided line straight with the distinction between forms and particulars. Uh, you remember in the diagram we drew, um, <laughs> that was the uh, hub of the wheel, the divided line, from which along the spokes you can work out to talking about art and education and ethics and history and so on and so on and so forth. Yeah. Same with people like Leibniz. Okay, now um, let's then uh, move on to this um, number six. Mind and body. Aha. This, after all, is one of the major issues which divides these three continental metaphysical systems of the 17th century, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz. Uh, the mind-body problem. Now, um, I, I've already indicated some of the basics that are involved in this. Uh, one is that monads are causally disconnected one from the other. Okay, they're windowless, causally disconnected. Uh, another is that. Um, um, bodies, physical bodies, material bodies, are composites of monads. And if it's a living thing, then there is a, a unifying monad, the soul monad. And notice that he's using soul in much the same sense as the Greeks, where the soul is the source of life. It's what gives life. It's um, related to form, what gives a particular nature. Um, it's related to um, entelechy, the particular function of the thing. So the, um, the body of an animal is unified by a living soul, okay, a living soul, which makes that hunk of matter a living animal, which otherwise it wouldn't be, with appropriate life functions involving degrees of apperception and apperception. Now, um, if we're talking of uh, bodies then, there are cause-effect relationships between bodies, between these composites. Because when you get myriads of monads, and he says millions, when you get myriads of monads organized and unified, they begin to take on spatial extension. Now, monads themselves don't have spatial extension. To begin with, they're not substantive in any solid sense. They're infinitesimal. They don't take up space. 
So they don't have size, shape, density, other spatial occupancy characteristics. What we've learned to call primary qualities. They don't have them. But bodies which are composites do occupy space. They do have primary qualities. And now you can begin to see how he's going to make room for mechanistic science. It's the science of the relationships between bodies that doesn't tell us anything about monads. How is it that he explains that one monad will no space or take up no space, plus another monad? Yeah. Yeah, courtesy of Zeno's paradoxes. Uh, you remember Zeno's paradoxes um, of weight, for instance. If one millet seed weighs nothing, and you have in a sack a hundred thousand millet seeds, each weighing nothing, how come it makes a thud? Um, the only clue that I see in Leibniz is in his use of the term infinitesimal. You see, by infinitesimal, he doesn't mean it has no size, it means it has no measurable size. So infinitely small. So that when you get a very large number, then you begin to get size. I don't see any other explanation within him. Yeah. Is this somewhat like an atomistic idea? No, you see, if atom means a little pellet of matter, no, it's not atomistic. Um, and he rejects the term atom for precisely that reason. Democritus atoms were little solid pellets. A monad is not a little solid pellet. Yes, I Now, um, if on the other hand you mean is this... Um, atomistic, like a more contemporary conception of atoms, as composed of um, subatomic particles, which particles may just be functions of energy, you see. Uh, all right, yeah. But for that, you've got to get an energistic physics going, in which matter is derivative from energy, rather than um, the other way around. Okay. Now, I, I think the, the problem that um, Kristen has is how matter is derivative from energy at that stage of understanding. And really, he doesn't have a good explanation apart from what I suggest about the term infinitesimal. So you'd have to say, well, uh, wait until we understand uh, energistic physics. So. Okay, so there are causal relationships then between bodies, but not between monads. Now, the um, the the soul, the the soul monad, or in the case of humans, the spirit monad, is the unifying, organizing principle, as well as the life-giving, thought-giving, direction-giving principle for the whole. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the ordered whole. So it is as if the soul does for a body what God does for the universe, apart from the orderers.